I want to begin the reading in verse 21. We'll read down through verse 28. This really there's a there's a link, there's a connection between what's going on really from verse 13, at least down through chapter 17 and verse 13, and probably even beyond. And I'm not going to be <clears throat> drawing those connections this morning, but um, but just to let you know that that these are not disjointed, disconnected ideas uh, that Matthew is putting them together, as really do the other um, uh, uh, Mark and Luke. And I think there is a significant uh, purpose. And you know, when you read Scripture, sometimes there's the macro view and then there's the micro view. Uh, do you know what I mean by that? Uh, uh, th so there's the overall picture, the overarching picture. There's something that is fundamental and substantive that's sort of foundational. That, that would be more the macro view. The micro is how it works out in specifics. Uh, and so <clears throat> we're we're, there's different ways to approach a passage, and there'll probably be a combination of those uh, this morning. But let's begin reading in verse 21. From that time, and from that time is, is the time that Peter had confessed. He said, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus had pronounced a blessing upon him and then announced what it was that he was going to do. He was going to build a church, and Peter was going to be involved, and the other, the, the other apostles were going to be involved as well in the foundation of that which he was going to do, and the proclamation of that kingdom, that message. So from that time, from that confession, the time of that confession, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. So the confession was not enough. Uh, though who Jesus is is fundamental to everything else, more was necessary. He had to do something. So he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I know that sounds shocking to us if you you know if you know the rest of the story but as you as you if you were in Peter's shoes and the other apostles living life as it was unfolding you might understand a little bit more why he would respond that way so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying far be it from you lord he loved him he loved Jesus he loved the lord he knew who he was and he loved him he didn't want any harm to come to him this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And sometimes we, we can be guilty of the same thing, making statements, making observations, evaluating, evaluating. With good intentions, we can say things that really are a contradiction to the very mind of God, the very purpose of God. And it's not that we, I'm talking about believers here. It's not that we're intending to do that, but it can happen. But thankfully, our Lord is very merciful, very kind, very loving. And he doesn't leave us there. He, he instructs us, he helps us, he brings us along. And so he does here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, and he doesn't just do it here. The rest of his journey to the cross is going to be about un unfolding what his purpose was about. And then eventually the disciples, well, at least 11 of them, get it. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And that's kind of what Peter was, that's kind of where Peter was. For whoever desires to save his life will lose Peter, you can't have what you are thinking you want and really get what you really need. Jesus, I, I don't want you to die, and, and I don't want to die either. I, I want something that, in my mind, is bigger and better than suffering and death. 
For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Everything that Jesus had to do was necessary for the gaining of the souls, for him to be satisfied with that e eternal purpose, really, of God in his everlasting love to gather a people for himself. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father. So here Jesus is peering beyond, beyond, beyond the cross that's coming for him. He's, he's peering beyond and seeing what is coming. The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I want to, Lord willing, take a couple of weeks in this passage trying to, trying to get from it what at least I believe God would have for us to see from it. Peter has just confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was God the Father who made that known to Peter. And, and it wasn't just the bare facts of that. I think Peter really understood, at least to some degree, what he was saying. He understood who Jesus was. There was more to understand, of course, as there is always more to understand. And yet, Peter did not clearly understand the full implications, did he? of what he confessed. And, and I think if, any, if, if, if you were being honest, and I'm talking here to believers, if, if you're honest, you would say, that's true for you. And of course, we're all growing, and I've tried to repeat this thought through these messages as we're going through the Gospels. And we can be hard on the apostles. We can be hard on them for the things they did not know. We say, well, how did they not know that? Well, how did we not know? How do we not know some of the things that seem to be so clear to others who have grown and advanced in their Christian walk? But we're all really on this journey of growing, aren't we? But grow, we will, and understand we will from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. That is the life of a Christian. But Peter and the others didn't yet know why Jesus must go to Jerusalem to suffer and die, and he didn't understand the kind of kingdom the sovereign Christ would establish. After all, if he's the sovereign Christ, what does, what does death have to do with a sovereign Christ? What does suffering have to do with a sovereign Christ? Humiliation of suffering and, and death did not fit their anticipated kind of kingdom. Peter was thinking more like Satan than God. But in love, Jesus rebukes Peter and then begins to reveal a glory that required suffering and death. And only then would resurrection life be realized. And, and Jesus didn't hide that from them and be raised the third day and he continues to repeat that, but it's like they don't hear that. And that life would be the very power that would transform everything forever. And that's what the rest of the New Testament bears out. The kingdom Jesus established is different from the kingdom of Old Testament Israel. And that's one of the macro kind of thoughts that I think is, is, is being expressed in this passage and into chapter 17. There is a shift. There's a, there's a change going on. The kingdom of Christ is not established by sword or by force. That's what you read in the Old Testament, right? That's what you read in the kingdom that is called Israel, national Israel. 
But the kingdom that Jesus came to establish was to be established through the foolishness of preaching and the formation of outposts called churches in every nation in this present world, not just a geographical area called Palestine or we know as the boundaries of Israel, national Israel. And through suffering and apparent weakness, not through civil magistrates and military might. And this is important because there is a, a message in certain segments of Christianity today who believe that the kingdom of Christ will advance through the civil magistrates. And that's a message that Jesus strongly contends against. He did so in the, in the parables of the kingdom, you remember. But no, the Christ, the Son of the living God, is gathering out His people and He's doing it in a way that fits who He is. And that's what Jesus is describing here. Peter and the disciples didn't yet understand. They will, but they didn't yet understand what following Jesus would really involve. So they're learning, and we know the rest of their story, don't we? And Peter clearly writes about that. And Lord willing, next week, I'll make a reference to Peter today, 1 Peter. But next week, I think we'll look more into this idea of, of suffering and, and what Peter understood and saw. And he writes about that. But there are many today who call themselves Christians who do not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom in this world. And in particular, what it means to be his disciple. The kingdom life to which Jesus calls his disciples is a life that looks like his. And it will be life in conflict with the darkness. He's the light. You say, why, why, why didn't people come to Jesus if he was light and love? Why didn't they come to him? Why don't they come to him today? Well, John 3 describes the answer, gives us the answer, right? Because men love darkness. As someone mentioned recently from here, men naturally clothe themselves. They already clothe, but they clothe themselves with darkness to hide the light. They don't want to be exposed by by the light and, and love. And so the life that Jesus came to give and the life to which he calls those who would be his disciples is a life that is in conflict with darkness and the disorder of this world. And it will involve suffering of some kind, but it will be rich and rewarding both now and forever. And we'll touch upon that today, but I plan to address that more in depth next week, Lord willing, the suffering and the glory that go together. But Jesus didn't hide from would-be followers what it really meant to come after him. He's speaking here to his disciples and others, not just to the 11 or to the 12. There would be the 12 here. Not just to them. Mark includes the people makes it clear that he's speaking to others who had, in fact, he called the, Jesus called the people, and then he speaks to his disciples and the people. And Jesus is speaking to anyone who desires to come after him. Then Jesus said, verse 24, to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, This is his target audience. Anyone who desires, anyone who wills, anyone who has the, that interest, that desire to come after him. Being a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, is not a matter of adding him on to an already established life in order to fulfill your dreams or improve your lifestyle. And Jesus is making this very clear. He's speaking to anyone who desires to come after me. And what he says will really expose what you are really after. 
Jesus is getting to the heart that must exist in anyone who desires to follow him in his kingdom. Now, it's important here. I, I, you know, th there's so much potential for confusion, I think, in a message like this. And in reading the words of Jesus, especially if you read these words in isolation from the rest of Scripture and the rest of his life and what he, and what he came to, to do and how he proposed to do it. But Jesus is not answering the question here, what must I do to be saved? Faith in Him and His cross work and resurrection alone qualifies a sinner as righteous before God. You cannot make yourself righteous before God. That's not, Jesus is not giving a formula here in order for you to get to the point where you can finally say, I'm saved. You can read some messages, I think, as I did, and there's a lot of messages preached on this passage, that you come away with that idea that you've been displaced under a great burden to increase your effort to become a Christian. No, Jesus is identifying and distinguishing true disciples in his kingdom. And what he says here in these words is the desire of every born again person. If you are turned away by Jesus' words, if you, if you hear what Jesus is saying here and you are turned off or turned away, something is wrong in your view of Him. Something's wrong. You may not be born again, or there may just simply be confusion. And I don't want to jump to the conclusion that you're not born again, but something's wrong. If you know Him, there is nothing you desire above Him. But all that Jesus says here is contrary to our flesh. It's contrary to our natural thinking, isn't it? If anyone desires to come after me, he doesn't say, well, just let him come. Now, we do have that. Jesus says, come unto me. And sometimes he simply says, follow me. Here he's clarifying if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me only born again ones have the life of God in our souls to respond to what Jesus says here and if you are born again you hear what Jesus is saying and you don't recoil at it your flesh will recoil at it. And we'll touch upon that here in a moment. But Jesus is establishing to, uh, with us here the life of true disciples. And, and, and this is what we want to see. First of all, true disciples of Jesus respond to him in three specific ways. This is in verse 24. There are three imperatives here. These are not optional. He's not saying pick one. He's not saying skip two and pick the third one. These are necessary. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, does that describe you? Do you have that desire to come after Christ? Then here's what he says. Let him deny himself and let him take up his cross and let him follow me. Now this is not what is done to you. You hear what I'm saying? This is not what is done to you. It's what you do. It's your response. It's you being intentional as you bear the voice of the, as you hear the voice of the shepherd of his sheep. And so as you hear if anyone desires to come after me, are you hearing the voice of the shepherd? It's the shepherd speaking here. The good shepherd, as we've heard recently. 
He's speaking. What are you hearing? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, Jesus says. Well, what does he mean by that? He's not speaking about a possession or a habit. He's not saying deny yourself something. Remember, he's getting to the root. He's getting to the heart. He's not saying rid your life of something. He's not saying live like a squatter. He's not saying live in poverty. He said, he's not saying burn that big house down and build you a hut. He's not saying give something up for Lent. He's not saying deny yourself something. That's not what he's saying. What does he say? Well, you hear the words. He says, let him deny himself. 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 That's synonymous with verse 25. For whoever desires to save his life. His life is himself. This is the life of self that lives for now. Controlled by lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. It is, listen to this, it is self-love. And I, I, th th there's a connection here and I, I don't want to make the connection in a place that it doesn't really uh, have the emphasis that it, it should have. But this is fairly significant here when he says, let him deny himself. You see, you could do a lot of things and not be denying yourself. You can give all that you have to the poor. You can even give your body to be burned. But you're not denying yourself. In other words, you don't have love. You're still, you're still ruled by self-love, by self-promotion. You're a, a lover of pleasure, a, a popularity, a lover of ease, a lover of comfort, more than God. You can read that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In other words, this is a life driven by self-focused ambition. Himself is the flesh of Romans 7 and 8. Paul wrote in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Jesus says you must deny Yourself in chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, he says of Romans, because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot be, you cannot simply be yourself. People say today, I just want to be myself. No, you don't. You really don't. And I'm going to tell you something. While you address this issue at the entrance into the Christian life, this is an issue that you keep on addressing throughout your Christian life. This is not a one and done denying or a one and done taking up your cross or a one and done following. This, this, is, this is the life, as we'll see. And so when he says, let him deny himself, that is to... That is to disassociate. The idea of deny can mean a number of different things, but here Jesus is talking about disassociate. You see, you don't get, you will always have the flesh with you. But you must disassociate yourself from self as the Lord of your life. It means, as someone has summarized it, putting loyalty to Jesus before self-preservation. Your allegiance is no longer to yourself. So Jesus is identifying here the fundamental stumbling block 
to coming after him and following him wherever he leads. And what is the fundamental stumbling block? Yourself. Let him deny himself. Self keeps you focused on self. Therefore, you must disassociate from this ruling principle of your life, which is self and its accompanying sins of loveless living. Full of envy and greed and all the other things you can read about them in 1 Corinthians 13 that are just the opposite of love, that are sin. Self-absorbed, self-absorbed. And we're naturally that way, aren't we? We're naturally self-absorbed. So much so that the very suggestion of denying self stirs tension. Even in a believer. But we must deny self if we're going to follow him. And Jesus says this is priority number one. And, and if you think about it, denying self is really, it goes along with humility, doesn't it? It really does. You can't be filled with self, which is pride, and follow Christ. Not, not as Jesus says, follow me. This is why this is such an emphasis in Scripture to clothe yourself with humility, which is also so closely connected with love. Let him deny himself. Well, what else? He says, if anyone desires to come after me, these are the words of Jesus, let him deny himself, okay, and take up his cross. Take up his cross. Take up his cross, Luke adds, daily. And he's not referring here to something placed upon you. He's not saying take up the cross that is put on you. You know, like some people say, well, that's just my cross to bear. Something difficult in their life. You know, you have a, a tough marriage or a tough job or a tough whatever. And you say, well, that's my cross and I've got to, I just bear the cross. That, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. It's not something that's placed on you. It's something that you engage it's something that you are intentional about. You take up your cross. The His here is not Christ's cross, though it's related, as we'll see. But it's, it's the cross. It, you, he says, let him take up his cross. This language would have strongly resonated with those who heard, heard these words in the first century, especially with the Jews. They hated the cross. It was used against them. Many times in the Roman world. And I, I, I mean, I could give you stories here that would make you cringe about the way the cross was used. And they cringed. A cross represented a humiliating, horrifically painful death. But Jesus is saying, this is the way to life. Now, at this point, the disciples didn't really understand what the cross had to do with Jesus, right? Right? I mean, they weren't aware of that. that they, he had just said that they're going to, I must be killed. But, but they don't know how. He didn't say how. And he will tell them that, you know, I, if I, the Son of Man, am lifted up. And so there's this idea of being lifted up on the cross. He said, spoke, he said those words, speaking by which death he should die. And so he does identify that along the way. But at this point, this is, this is sort of a foreign idea to them in relationship to Jesus, but the cross itself was not a foreign idea. Now for you and me, and remember Peter and the others, as life went on and they saw the cross, this would become an exceedingly significant thought in their minds. They would connect the dots as they did in many things that Jesus taught them along the way. They will understand. But we're reading this from our vantage point. And we know what Jesus did. We know what the cross meant in relationship to Him. And what the cross meant in relationship to us because of the cross that He bore. And so when Jesus set these words out, He set these words out knowing that these words were going to be heard by those who would desire to come after Him for the rest of human history. And by us 2,000 years later, and so taking up our cross 
is to identify with Jesus who bore, and this is important, the curse of the cross. He bore the wrath of God upon that cross. He bore what was against those for whom He hung upon that cross. He did that for the disciples whom He says, take up your cross. In other words, taking up your cross is not a part of your redemption. It's not a part of you saving yourself. It is identifying with Him. In fact, the fact of the matter is, taking up our cross, which is painful to our flesh, as it, that idea always implies pain to your flesh, pain to yourself. There's going to be resistance. But taking up our cross and whatever pain that may bring is of absolutely no value apart from His cross. Are you hearing this? And I'm going to touch upon this, an application of this here in a few moments. But when we take up our cross, what are we doing? And I connect this with Romans chapter 6. And I believe fundamentally what we're doing and everything flows out of this is that we are reckoning ourselves truly to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the foundation of everything else about the life of the disciple. It, it, it is not simply taking on some hardship in life. It is not simply taking on suffering. Now, it may in involve that, as we'll, we'll get to next week, Lord willing. In fact, it will, to one degree or another. But you understand, there's no saving efficacy in that. And the only reason that taking up our cross is meaningful at all is because of the connection it has with Him who died upon the cross. As we reckon ourselves... Truly, to, and we do this daily, truly to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, because we died with Him and rose again with Him. So knowing our union and fellowship with Jesus in His suffering and death motivates us daily to sacrifice all that would get in the way of Him and the life that He calls us to live. And this is discipleship. As we take up our cross daily. And remember Paul said, use these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, I die daily. And we do that. We surrender our own lives in order to be identified with His life. And brethren, this is a life of selfless Love like His that does not shrink back from giving of ourselves in the fullest sense of the word. Giving, that's exactly what He did. Even if it results in suffering and death or martyrdom like many, in fact, the ones that He's speaking to here, I think all of them, or at least most of them, actually met a martyr's death. And thousands since then have done the same. And while we are not faced with the threat of literal death in our culture, at least not yet, if you pursue a desire to be a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, there will be suffering in and from this world. Let me just read 1 Peter chapter 2. This is the only uh, reference I think that I'll make today. To First Peter, but listen to these words. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. That's what a disciple does, doesn't it? A disciple follows his teacher who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And there's a boatload of application there for you and me. 
But brethren, this is not a message our, our modern Christian culture wants to hear. I was shocked. I mean, I, I know that there are groups out there that we would have nothing to do with. And, and I know there's some very popular groups. And I suppose it's okay for me to use a name. I mean, Paul did it, and so I'll just use a name here because you can see it on the Internet. You can type this in and you'll find it. Have you ever heard of Paula White? You know, the, the pastor of our former president, the personal pastor of our for, former president. Here's what she said. Anyone who tells you that you must deny yourself is from Satan. Now, granted, that is lifted. All, that's all I read. So it may be in a context that makes sense but I, for the life of me, cannot understand why anyone who reads the words of Christ would make such a statement like that. And who believes the words of Christ would make a statement like that to introduce confusion. Jesus is quite clear. The disciple should expect no less than his master. And so he told his followers in John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you. And by the way, I think there he was talking about the religious world of his day. I don't think he was talking about the whole secular world, though the application is to that. But he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And so Jesus says, if you desire to come after me, let him deny himself. If, if that's you, if you desire to come after Christ, deny yourself Take up your cross, and then you are ready for that final step, which is the life. Follow me. Let him follow me. And these things work simultaneously, though there is an order to them. There's a simultaneous work that's going on in the life of God's children. Follow me, he says. And oh, this is the goal and the life of every disciple who pursues, who desires to come after Jesus Christ. You desire to follow Him. And His was a life of selfless love, culminating in giving His very own life, resulting in resurrection life, so that His death was gained. And remember, everything that can be said about Jesus can be said about you. And whether it be suffering or whether it be death, if it is, in the following of Christ, you are following in His steps and you are receiving all that is His. His resurrection power and His resurrection life is the life that we find as we lose our own life. And that applies to right now as well as to forever. And that's what Jesus goes on to explain in the following verses. And so a true disciple, a true disciple of Jesus responds to him, to the voice of the shepherd, to these imperatives, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And a true disciple of Jesus is the only one who finds true life. Okay? Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It might seem to you, well, this is pretty simple uh to to grasp what he's saying and in one sense it is it's pretty plain language but i can tell you you can read multiple sermons on these on this passage that will bring you to a place of absolute confusion what is jesus saying and i trust that i'm right in the things that i'm about to give you because i don't want to be wrong I don't want to misrepresent my Savior. I don't want to misrepresent our God. But brethren, there are many 
even professing Christians that so value their own self-absorbed dreams, pursuits, pleasures, and relationships in this world, that they will do anything to preserve their life, their life. And I don't think that simply means your breath. In other words, to be kept from actually physically dying. But it's your life, the one that you are choosing to live, the one that brings you the most whatever, the most satisfaction. They may follow Jesus for a while until following Him brings resistance from the world. You remember, Jesus already talked about this in the parables of the sower and the seed, the various soils. The ones that respond joyfully. But then persecution and tribulation comes because of the Word. And they depart. And there are those who will, at least they think they want to follow Jesus. But they don't know what it is to deny self and take up His cross and really, really truly follow Him. They don't know the life of Jesus. And so when family or friends or colleagues began to create a problem for them, begin begin to pose difficulty for them something happens and you see one whose heart is consumed with self and by the way what I'm about to say to you might happen temporarily even in one who is truly born again this is serious business but but, but this will happen to one who is not truly born again when Jesus doesn't prove out to be what they thought. Following Jesus, going after Him, doesn't prove out to be what they thought it was going to be. Listen, this is one of the reasons why Jesus is saying what He's saying. You know, in other places, He, he would say to people, count the cost. But one whose heart is consumed with self and this world, I'm talking about this present world, is going to preserve it. And they will either, when that gets threatened, they will either forsake Jesus altogether, or they will imagine a Jesus that is non offensive. And that is affirming of their self-absorbed life. And there are multitudes today who are there. And you can see it on church signs. We are an affirming church. And they'll talk about Jesus. They'll present a Jesus to people, to the world. But Jesus says, if you desire to save your life, you will lose it. It's what he says. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. That desire is going to win out. And whatever gain or satisfaction, you know, you can stuff that desire for a while to save. I've seen this in people's lives. They stuff that desire. You wouldn't think that desire was even in there. But eventually it comes out. And sometimes you may wonder, I just didn't expect so-and-so to go in the direction to depart from Jesus or to go in the direction that I didn't expect that of them. I never saw it. I never heard it. But inside, truth be told, inside, all along, there was this desire to save their life. And Jesus says, if that's your desire, you're going to lose it. And whatever gain or satisfaction your life that you pursue may bring you is temporary at best. Are you hearing Jesus? The shepherd is speaking.
A self-serving life, a self-absorbed life is absolutely empty of the love of Christ. And no matter what temporary enjoyment you may find, in the end, you will lose it all. Whoever desires to save his life, you're going to lose your life. Everything about your life, you will lose it. But a true disciple, a true disciple is the one who doesn't just desire to lose his life, he does. Did you notice that? He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life, I suppose you might imply Jesus, uh, the word desire, but that's not what he says. He, he says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For Jesus' sake. Jesus is not talking about a self-focused sacrifice here for some personal agenda or gain. There are a lot of religious people or religious organizations and a lot of people and even secular folks who are willing to sacrifice an awful lot to gain what they want. But it's what they want. And they'll even go through painful things. Sometimes experiencing more painful sacrifices than you and I who are followers of Christ, at least on a physical level. But Jesus is not talking about a self-focused sacrifice for some personal agenda or some self-interest, some gain of self-interest to your flesh. But brethren, the sacrifice of one who sees no ultimate value in self or life apart from Jesus is what he's talking about here. For whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The sacrifice of one who sees no ultimate value in self or life apart from Jesus. Now this is not a killjoy life of drudgery that Jesus is calling us to. Some people present this in such a way that people are being called to try to be something that they are not. It's not what's going on here. Remember, he's talking to those who are who desire to come after him in a genuine way. And ultimately, if we could fast forward beyond the cross and, and to the imparting of the Holy Spirit and the experience of the vital union with Christ, he's speaking to those of us who are united to Christ and it's from that union that life blossoms forth. And it's a joy-filled life. It's not a life that's simply cutting this out and cutting that out and not doing this and doing that. It's not that kind of life. No, Jesus is talking about the response of one who sees the beauty and the glory of Jesus. And you are willing to remove anything and everything that gets in the way. In fact, you are asking for that. That the Spirit of God who indwells you might remove from you and your life, from your vision, anything, blinders, anything that is keeping you from seeing, increasingly seeing the glory and the beauty of Christ. That's a disciple. In fact, this is the one who has found true life. The life of Christ. The life of Christ. Not your life. The life of Christ is the life of a true disciple. Isn't this what the rest of the New Testament bears out? The Apostle Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, it is no longer I who live. It is no longer self. 
In fact, somebody said this verse is probably the best commentary on what Jesus is saying. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, so you're still in the flesh, but I don't live according to the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I had Brother Del read Philippians chapter 3 because I wanted you, hear, wanted you to hear that. We are those who are circumcised in the heart. Something has happened inside of us and, and we no longer have confidence in the flesh. And, and, and we are willing, yea, beyond willing, we want to let go of everything, including what we once thought was gain, even religious things. Maybe I should say especially religious things. That we once depended upon. For our favor with God, the Apostle Paul said, but what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Are you hearing? Jesus is saying, follow me. This is what he's saying. Not, not just track after me. Follow me. For whom I have suffered the law, for whom... I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain. Not something from Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many beautiful blessings that come to us from Christ. But Paul's heart here is that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith. Through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God, which is from God, by faith. What did he say earlier in Philippians 1, 21? And by the way, remember, Paul is writing from prison here. He's suffering. But he says, for to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Colossians chapter 3. I believe these are all explanations of what Jesus is driving at. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, If then you were raised with Christ, and these are the only ones who really are seeking after Him and who really want Him. And so when, they, when we hear, when we hear deny ourself, separate yourself from self that is keeping you from the one that you come to know and the one that you love and desire, you willingly respond, yes, and you daily will bear that cross, that identity with the Christ who died for you. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. I mean, is Jesus saying you can't think about anything? I mean, you know, I, this, is, this is real. I'm asking this as a real a solid question because sometimes I have gotten so consumed that I have thought I can't think about anything else. I should not think about anything else. If I if I think about who won that football game, I have all I've departed from Christ. Or if I, I think about Pearl Harbor, what were you thinking about Pearl Harbor for? Why were you thinking about getting that gear greased up right? Why, why, you shouldn't be thinking about that. Let your kids starve. It's more important for you to think about Christ. No, no. You, 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 we're, we're prone to extremes as we respond to Scripture. That's not what's being said. No, but as you set your things, your mind on things above, everything on earth falls into place, doesn't it? Your relationship to earth, your relationship to things, your relationship to possessions, your, your relationship to everything and everyone falls into place because you're following Him. For you died and your life 
This is, this is life. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, so when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And you remember what Paul said in 1 Thess- 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 about bodily exercise profits little or for a little while or a little bit. But godliness is profitable in relationship to all things now and forever. You see? That's the life of Christ. This is abundant life that overflows with the selfless love and power of Christ that makes us willing to deny self and to give of ourselves for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, he says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Because when you lose your life for Christ's sake, you are ready then to give your life for the sake of others. And this has huge implications for everything else in the New Testament in this age in which we live Because we will do that even at the expense of discomfort, hurt, rejection, and even death. And so the attitude of the disciple who is hearing the shepherd's voice is this. Take the world, but give me Jesus. This is the heart of a true disciple. And then just let me quickly, quickly, and I I mean that. I'll just read, read these statements that I have in closing here, not expand upon them. But Jesus reasons in verse 26. He reasons, and this is so important. And it's almost like this is, this is a point that Jesus is driving home to everyone who is hearing this. He's appealing to us. He's appealing to us to think about the value of our never dying soul. You are not just going to live and die. Uh, and anyone who would depart from Jesus as one who has who does not value their soul. And I would say anyone who doesn't come to Jesus is one who does not value their soul. Jesus said, for what profit is it? He's just talked about losing and finding. And then he says, for, you see the, the chain of reasoning, the logic here, 4, 4, 4, and verse 26, 25, 26, and 27. These thoughts follow one another. 4. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? You see, that, that's the person whose life is this life. It's your life. It's right now. And of course, no one has ever nor can gain the whole world. He's speaking hyperbolically. hyperbolically. He's, he's giving this extreme, right? But even if you could... And you lose your own soul. What, what, what have you gained? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is it? What is it? What is your life all about? What in this world is so valuable for, for which you would actually refuse the voice of the shepherd? That you would forsake Jesus. And lose your own soul. Your soul. How valuable is your soul? Your soul is everything. To lose your soul is to lose every sense of connection and enjoyment with anything you have gained in this world. If you don't have a soul, you can't enjoy what you presently have in this world. It's your soul that enables you to enjoy anything, saved or lost. Your soul is the most valuable part of you, and that's why those, the the multi-bazillionaires in the world, when, when when they're dying or when they have some disease, they will spare no expense to preserve their life, their soul, And they come to see that everything that they have amassed is really nothing. If they do not have a soul to enjoy it. Your 
Your soul is the most valuable part of you. And as it goes, so goes you and everything that is valuable to you. Or maybe I should say most valuable to you, lest we again go to, off into an improper extreme here. Your soul is, is tied to what is most valuable to you. If you're devoted to self and this world, that, that's your devotion, that's your ambition. You are separated from Jesus. And you, that is your life, your soul, will be separated in hell forever from all that you hold dear now. To renounce all that once, that you once held dear. To follow Jesus, that's the heart of one who sees the value not only of your soul, but the worth of Jesus. In other words, you've got to have Him. And this soul will never lose what is most valuable to you if you have Jesus. Do you hear that? And Jesus is appealing to you here. The shepherd is, is appealing. He's the one who's saying these things. Do you hear his voice? Do you hear him saying, follow me? And if you do, then when you hear him say, deny yourself and take up your cross, that will not be offensive to you. Because in your mind, you'll be thinking, if anything, including myself, is in the way of him, I don't want it. Jim Elliot famously said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot gain, what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. The Apostle Paul famously said, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may win Christ. Because you see, He is eternal life. He is eternal life. And His true disciples follow Him. Wherever He leads, all the way to eternal glory. Listen, that's life. That's abundant life. It's not simply what is out there. It's what you have right now in relationship to him and he in relationship to you. Father, I pray.